Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I build one of my most expensive tables ever, and for once, everything actually goes to plan. Until the client changes his mind about what exactly he's looking for halfway through the build. Not long ago, I bought a tree, or at least all of the wood available from this particular Bastone Walnut tree, because the wood was so exceptional. It was the type of wood that is normally set aside for instrument makers or luthiers or something like that. And the client that's been waiting for this table, he was promised a 50 inch by 50 inch single slab table. And this wood was just a little bit smaller than that. And I told him, I go, hey, we can still get you a 50 inch table, but the wood will not be this cool. How do you feel about a 47 inch table? And he said, absolutely, I want that Bastone. 47 inches is just fine. Do this myself. Okay, come give me a hand. As you can see there, my video guy Scott is super helpful. He's always offering to help me move these slabs around, but I told him part of the charm of this channel is people like to see me get crushed under slabs, so treat it like a nature documentary and only intervene if you absolutely have to. And if something horrible does happen, the first rule is keep rolling, get the shot. These Bastone walnut slabs definitely weren't cheap. However, given the quality of wood for once, I was actually really pleased with the price that I paid. Each of these slabs cost me just under $3,000 and I'm obviously gonna need this slab for the table top and I'm planning on worst case scenario using the other big slab for the table base. However, I do have some offcuts from the same tree that I'm hoping I can utilize for the table base and have a lot less waste. And more importantly, use that other slab for another big project. and. The cost to the client for this table is $17,000, at least right now, because that cost does in fact go up because he changes the design rather dramatically. Speaking of prices, anytime I put the price of one of my projects in the video title, I always have some people that comment saying, Hey man, it is not a good look to brag about your prices like that. Why don't you just make it about the woodworking? and?" I have to clarify why I put the prices in there because it's not bragging. It is just a boastful illustration of a superficial achievement with a misguided desire of gaining the respect and admiration of people I've never met, which is probably why I do YouTube to begin with. Sorry, things got kind of fuzzy there for a second. Anyway, like I was saying, I only share the prices of these items because it adds interest to the story and there's a lot of curious viewers out there. Definitely not bragging. I get a lot of questions about these C channels and I tend to leave this process out of a lot of videos and I realized I haven't shown this in a while so I'm bringing it back. And the biggest misconception about these C channels is that people think that it makes the wood stronger and I assure you this wood is plenty strong. It would never just break. I mean, I don't even know how much weight it would take to break it, probably in the thousands of pounds. The only thing these C channels do is just mitigate the wood movement in the form of cupping and bowing. And I've had some pretty interesting anecdotal examples that I can't really share because they're hard to explain, but these C channels do make a huge difference. I get these ones from Concept 13. They're actually made for woodworking. Just add some threaded inserts and you tighten them down with these kind of flat headed Murakashi style bolts, allowing that C channel to move around the wood, or I guess allowing the wood to move around the C channel and they really, really do make a big difference on any slab, I say over 30 inches, I highly recommend putting them in. The design that this client requested when he first reached out before he made the rather aggressive design change was actually a really cool timeless coffee table design. So much so that I thought it'd be fun to simultaneously build a scaled down version of this table at the same time. And the scaled down version is still a good sized table. It's gonna be 30 inches by 30 inches. It's got a map of burl top and a walnut base. And I'll have a full build video on my other channel, Blacktail Studio Uncut. And as a bonus for you guys, I'm just gonna give that table away. I Used to sell a lot, a lot more of my stuff, but now I just have more fun giving stuff away. So there's details on the giveaway in the video description. It's completely free to enter. And if you're interested in tackling one of these projects yourself, I'm gonna have plans for sale of both that scaled down version and this larger table. I mentioned earlier that the client had originally paid for a 50 inch by 50 inch table. And 
I'd come back to him and said, hey, I have this exceptional piece of wood, but the biggest I can go is 47 inches. And he said, yep, that'll be fine, just no smaller. And as I got it trimmed down, I realized I wasn't gonna get that full 47 inches either. And I couldn't go back to him and say, hey, it'll be 45 now. So I had to get really creative with how I stretched these corners out to get that full 47 inches. And I am not that good of a woodworker. So this was a little bit beyond my skill or beyond anything I had done so far, but I thought that I could pull it off. And all I'm doing there is just trying to get a nice flat spot on the corner because over here I have an off cut and that lighter wood that you see is called the sap wood. That's the wood on the edge of the slab. So what I'm doing is I'm cutting off a chunk of this, trying to match that grain and color as closely as I can. I spent a lot more time than I'm showing here, cutting multiple pieces, cutting them at different angles, jointing different sections, trying to find the perfect color and also the perfect grain orientation. Because as I'm recording this now, I realize I never actually told the client I did this. So my goal is he doesn't realize this happened until after he watches this video. I left this block awkwardly clamped on there overnight, came back the next day, removed the clamps, and now I was gonna try to trim it up without hurting the slab. And I know these flush cut saws or Ryobas are supposed to not scrape the wood, but they always do. So I'm using some painter's tape to protect the wood as I go through the cutting process. And this Ryoba here is just a relatively cheap one. I think I got it at Woodcraft. I'd like to say it's some ancient Japanese one, but it's a pretty basic one, but it does do the job here. I will admit, I like almost everything about being a woodworking YouTuber. There is only two things that I can think of that I don't like, and one of those is when people ask what I do, I have to tell them I'm a woodworking YouTuber, which is super awkward and uncomfortable. The other thing is the clients have access to see how the sausage is made, meaning a normal woodworker wouldn't have to show their clients what they did on this corner and the clients would never know. However, my client's gonna get his table, hopefully be thrilled, then watch this video and go, oh, I, I can see that corner now. I don't know if I like that. So those are the two things I don't like about being a woodworking YouTuber. Just like all my tables, I spent a ton of time doing the little touch-ups. On the Mappa, I had a ton of touch-ups to do with that hot melt kind of hot glue stuff. On this one, I did mostly CA glue. And again, I am only giving you a fraction of the time that I spend doing this. I usually spend about half to a full day just on touch-ups. Some of you probably recognize those holes in the slab there, and those holes are where the sawmill hammers some pins down and checks the moisture while the slab is in the drying process. And they do a really, really good job of getting the exact moisture in the very middle of the slab. The only downside is it leaves big freaking holes in the top of my table that I have to fill. And I could use epoxy or CA glue, but then it would just look like a couple of black dots on top of the table. So I've recently been kind of practicing a new skill. Someone told me about this and I was like, all right, I can try that. And what I do is I make these little toothpicks, but the hard part about these is you have to make it so the grain runs the opposite direction from like a toothpick would. And so it makes them really, really weak, but you want that same kind of face grain to be up after you hammer it in. And that one went in pretty good. i try that again with this one and it broke. Luckily though, it broke on top of the table because if it broke down inside, I'd have to drill it out and try it all over again. Speaking of checking the moisture content of these slabs, based on my last video, I'm sure a lot of you have already left this comment and thank you in advance for that. But yes, I did thoroughly check the moisture content of these slabs before starting work on them. and. If you don't understand the reference, I am actively trying to repress the memories from my last video, so I won't go into it. If you wanna check it out, I'll leave a link in the video description, but it was basically the worst woodworking experience of my life. The sanding process for this table was actually a little bit different than I normally do, because I now have a nano finish product that goes over my usual finish, I get much more sheen, much more protection, and it enables me to sand it slightly different. I'll have more information towards the end of the video as well as some additional videos on my new sanding and finishing process.
I was finally ready to get started on this custom base, and for once, I actually have great news. I got the plans drawn up for this, and I consulted them, and I realized I won't have to cut up that big slab just to make the table base. I have enough wood in these offcuts so that everything will match perfectly, and I can save that huge slab for another feature project. So pretty excited about that. And if you are interested in purchasing those plans, they are for sale in the video description. And it's kind of a two for one deal. I decided I would include both that 30 by 30 inch coffee table, as well as this monster 47 inch by 47 inch coffee table. This client first approached me over a year ago and he came to me with a pretty timeless design. It was a walnut base with a walnut shelf on a, and a walnut top. And I said, yeah, absolutely, that'll look great. And anyway, over a year goes by and he's coming up in his turn in the queue. And I said, hey, we're about ready to start. And he's like, hey, I had a couple ideas. And I was like, oh, sure. I mean, people come up with changes, come up with ideas all the time. That's part of building custom furniture. And he said, what about a steel shelf? And I go, steel, like, eh, okay, maybe. And he's like, or aluminum. And I'm like, I mean, maybe. And he said, uh, let me draw up some designs. And I said, okay. And first thought I had was like a quarter inch aluminum shelf that would be kind of sliced into these legs. And I'm like, that might be kind of cool. And then he tells me that he wants to do a one inch thick solid piece of aluminum. And I was like, that might look ridiculous. Although I didn't actually say that to him. I said, oh, interesting. But thinking that aluminum shelf for one, is gonna be so heavy. Two, I don't even know how expensive that's gonna be. And three, I don't know how I would make that work with this existing design. And eventually he just fell in love with the idea and I didn't have the heart to say, I don't like it. I was like, well, maybe it'll end up being cool. But at this point I was sweating it and I knew how to make this part of it, but I had no idea how I was gonna incorporate a one inch thick aluminum shelf to it. I was willing to try this aluminum shelf on the big table, but for the MAPA table, I didn't want to mess with that. So that one I'm continuing to do a walnut shelf and walnut legs, again, that more timeless design, but the plans had to be modified. So the plans that you will get are one, the traditional plans for the MAPA, and two, you get the plans for this wild heavy aluminum shelf, and we will just have to see how it turns out. And here I'm just cutting my stock pieces. These are all four legs, making sure each one of them is cut exactly the same. About now, I started making some calls and seeing if I could even source one inch sheets of aluminum. And to my surprise, it was actually really easy. One of the first places I called said, yep, absolutely. Give us the dimensions and we'll cut it out on this water jet here. So told them I need a 35 inch by 35 inch piece of aluminum. They cut it out for me. I picked it up a week later and it weighed 120 pounds and cost $700, which I actually thought was a really good deal. I was expecting like $2,000. All the guys at IRC seemed pretty interested in the camera and kind of excited that I was making a video on this. And I try not to let my notoriety go to my head, but those guys were obviously big fans of Black Pale. While I was getting started on this aluminum sheet, I was also continuing to work on the walnut shelf for the MAPA table. And even though there's a few more steps in that one, that one was gonna be much, much easier than working with this behemoth. The only good thing is it gave me an excuse to buy some new tools. I saw Izzy Swan had these on his channel. I'm a big fan of his. So I bought two of them, admittedly, basically only for this particular part of the project. I used them one other time and this is the only reason I bought these. The project here turns into a bit of a nail biter. This is where I could very easily mess things up. That aluminum shelf measures exactly 1.03 inches. So I need to come up with a spacer where it fits this wood exactly tight with no visible gap. However, that shelf is also gonna have powder coat on it. And so I need to allow for just enough room for the powder coat, but not so much that you could actually see a gap. And I'm mimicking this design from the curved epoxy table that I did a couple of months back. I thought it was actually a really cool design. You can see it going on there. And I love the way that worked, but this one's gonna be harder because that one I had felt on, so I was able to kind of cheat the fit so it didn't have to be that tight. This one won't have any felt. There's gonna be just wood, then aluminum, and it's gotta fit absolutely flawlessly. So yeah, I am a little bit nervous. I did call the powder coat place, and they told me that their powder coat is about three to five thousandths of an inch, and it's gonna be on each side, so I allowed for 200. So worst case scenario, if they do what they say they're gonna do, I will have a one one hundredth of an inch gap between the wood and aluminum, in theory anyway.
To recap what I'm attempting to do if it wasn't clear so far and I can't see a world in which that was clear how I explained it, my aluminum is 1.03 inches thick. The powder coat between the top and the bottom should be 0.01 inches thick for a total of 1.04. I'm cutting a spacer that is 1.05 inches, giving me a margin of error of 1 100th of an inch. None of this has ever been taught to me. I don't even know if this, is, this will work. It's just something that works in my head. So we will just have to wait and see if somehow, some way, this actually works. After I got my notch cut, I got the calipers back out to see how close my jig was and 1.05 and change. So should be right on track for that aluminum to fit with the powder coat. I got my butt chisels and my corner chisel out to square the edges up on both tables, the Mappa table and the big walnut table. And I'm embarrassed to say that I had a whole joke written out about using my corner chisel to quote, cut corners, but then I realized I'm not a dad. I don't really do dad jokes and my humor is better suited to antagonizing Beatle fans or riling up the nine tenths of the world that is apparently wildly anti-circumcision or at least anti-joking about circumcision in a woodworking video. Unrelated observation, did you notice the uncut slab in the beginning kind of looked like a shriveled sea anemone, but fast forward to the end of this video with a cut edge, it just looks like a finished product, not a genetic mistake that needed to be corrected with a blade. This is either the best time or the worst time to say, don't forget to like and subscribe. Anyway, the jig seemed to work and now I can work on creating a jig for the aluminum. If you missed it, my legs were exactly 1.96 inches thick, and so I set my miter saw to 45 degrees, made a couple of cuts until I got to exactly 1.96 inches, and you can be off by a little bit there. It's not gonna be a big deal if you're off by a hundredth of an inch or so. Nailed on a couple of scrap pieces that are gonna help hold it in place when I go to use the router. Also, good tip, use a straw to remove glue squeeze out. Marked my line, and I'm gonna remove the bulk of this with my track saw. If you have good carbide blades, you can cut aluminum with it. And I'm not trying to cut up to my line at this point. I'm just gonna remove the bulk of it. And I was a little bit nervous using the track saw here, but I made some slow and shallow cuts, eventually getting pretty co close to the line. And now I can bring my jig back in and I found that it was easiest to set it on the underside. Got my router out. I used an old uh, bit for this one because I was a little bit nervous and it worked remarkably well. And so now the width of that corner is gonna be exactly the width of my leg. I replicated that same style jig for the smaller table base. However, those legs were a little bit thinner, so my jig, of course, needed to be a little bit smaller. Came back to the large table base, did a quick test fit just to make sure everything fit. Everything did fit and look good, so I was ready to start rounding over the edges on this aluminum. You'll notice I didn't just run that router all the way to the end of the notch, and it's hard to explain, but if I was to take that round over all the way inside, it would actually leave a slight gap. And so what I did is I just kind of feathered it into that eighth inch round over with the hand file and the sandpaper. I recently bought this Powermatic drill press with my own money, and I'd posted some different videos of it online, and I was shocked at the number of comments that said something to the effect of, Made in China, question mark, question mark, emoji that led me to believe it was not a complimentary statement. And I do think it's worth giving at least my opinion on the whole made in China thing, because this is made in Taiwan, which is part of China. But made in China or made in Taiwan does not mean poorly made. China is capable of making anything the United States is capable of making. The United States has made tons of junk. The United States has made tons of quality products. China has made tons of junk. Germany, I don't think Germany's made any junk, but just the fact that something is made in Taiwan or made in China has absolutely nothing to do with the quality. So do yourself a favor, get rid of those stigma and those stereotypes because you're gonna end up with worse tools if you insist on only buying power tools made in the United States. Because guess what? There are not many large power tools made in the United States these days. If you missed what I did there, I drilled two vertical holes on the drill press, came back and enlarged those holes, leaving just the final inch or so of that smaller diameter, came back with the shoulder list style threaded insert, and got that just below the surface. And what this is gonna be used for is this quarter 20 set screw, where it just goes in there like that, 
And now I can insert that into the threaded insert and this is gonna be what holds the shelf in place. All of these legs are gonna be very, very similar, but they could be off by a couple of millimeters. So I wanna marry each leg to each corner and the aluminum still has to be powder coated. So I put these little notches in each corner. So this is leg number two. I put a couple of Sharpie marks on top of the leg that you'll never see to indicate that that is leg number two. And now I know this one will forever match this corner. And you'll see here why that matters is I'm using these set screws as kind of a marking device so I can make sure they go exactly where they need to be. And as a little trick, I learned this from some of the Festool tools. I'm drilling these holes here just slightly inward from where the set screws are. And that means as that set screw tightens, it's gonna pull it even tighter. And so it makes sense in a little bit, but that set screw is gonna kind of slope down in there. And as it does, it's gonna pull the leg even tighter into the shelf. If all of this aluminum cutting and set screws just seems like way too much work, do yourself a huge favor and just do a wood shelf like I did on the smaller table base. That way you just build your notch to the exact thickness of your wood. And I'm just using a little bit of epoxy to hold that one in. This may come as a shock to some of you, but I watch a lot of YouTube and one of the things that shocks me on there is how many people always say, don't forget to like, subscribe and hit that bell. And first off, let me be very clear, nothing would mean more to me than if I have earned your subscription and you choose to subscribe. That is the highest honor and I really genuinely do appreciate it. It does make a big difference to my page if you decide to subscribe. However, the bell, the bell means that you get notified when I do anything on YouTube. So. Maybe I'm doing a live, maybe I make a community post, maybe I have an online poll. And if you're not a big fan of mine, you're gonna get really annoyed really fast and you're gonna remember, hey, I don't like this guy, I wanna unsubscribe. So unless you wanna be very, very serious, bordering on exclusive with me, don't hit that bell. But again, I would genuinely appreciate it if you do hit that subscribe button. A couple years ago here on YouTube, I made a how to get a perfect finish in your home shop or garage video that did really well. I was really proud of it and it was really well received. However, it's been a few years. There's been some technological advances. I've learned some tips and tricks. So instead of just making another how to video here on YouTube, I have a full time video guy. So while we were building this table, I said, hey, let's film a finishing workshop. And the original idea was I was going to charge for it just like my epoxy workshop because it's going to be like an hour to an hour and a half long. But at least for right now, and I can't promise it'll be like this forever, it's gonna be completely free. And it's not like a bait and switch. It's not like you get into the workshop and you kind of start taking it and then you have to pay to finish it. If you sign up, you will get the entire workshop. It'll be completely free. And maybe eventually I'll charge for it because it is a really, really valuable workshop. There's tons of useful information in there. Something I'm really, really proud of. Scott, my video guy, has just been crushing it because we had over four hours of footage that he had to sift through when making this virtual workshop. So there will be a link to that new finishing workshop. Again, it's free for now, but I wouldn't wait to sign up for that because I may eventually decide to charge for it. When I started building these two tables, I thought they would be essentially the same, but a few small differences here and there. And as it turns out, they were wildly different. For one, the finish on the Mappa table was much different. I actually tried my hand at spray finishing for the first time in my life, and actually went pretty well. The mounting system is another one and that's what I'm doing here is I made these small little C channels and these are gonna be for the heavy table. On the smaller table, I was able just to use some figure eight fasteners and they worked really well. But this top on the large table weighs over 200 pounds. The base itself weighs about 200 pounds. So it's gonna be literally a 400 pound table. So I have to make sure that the mounting system holds up. If someone decides they wanna scoot this across the floor or lift it up a little bit, it has to be able to support all of that weight. So there was quite a few more differences than I was expecting originally. I was extraordinarily nervous about two things at this point, and one of those was how was this actually going to look? I know that it was the customer's idea, but what if this big block of aluminum just looks ridiculous with the walnut? And two, what if it doesn't fit? Because that one's on me. I did my best estimations, but at this point, I don't know if this aluminum was going to fit into that very tight notch. Good thing. I don't know. What do you think? I think it, I think it should. <laughs> uh, they're made a little loose, right? Yeah. What happens if it doesn't? What happens if it doesn't fit? Uh, there's always a way. Okay. 
Okay. Oh. Pretty good. That'll do. The good news is they weren't too tight. They actually fit on there. However, they were maybe just a tiny bit looser than I was expecting. So now really need to test out those set screws. And sure enough, they held it perfectly tight. And holy crap, I love the way this looks at this point. And I'm not bragging when I say that because I did not think this was a good idea. This was all the customer's idea. I guess it shouldn't surprise me because black with walnut is kind of my thing, but I am thrilled at this point. And this is why occasionally I do actually listen to the customers. I am not completely out of the woods yet. I still have to see if this experimental mounting system is going to work and I am going to test it. I'm going to lift the entire corner of the table by just one of those straps to see if anything's going to break because threaded inserts in the end grain might not quite be as strong as the long grain. And one of the good things about my channel is you know that I will show it if something terrible happens because secretly when something bad happens in the shop, I always know, well, at least people will enjoy the YouTube video a little bit more. So I never shy away from showing my sometimes rather large failures. All right, is that gonna be strong enough to hold it? I think so. Yeah, yeah, you'll be good. I need your opinion because I didn't think anything of it in real time, but as I'm sitting here doing this voiceover and listening to Scott just then, and he said, yeah, you'll be good. I think he sounded a little disappointed. I think that he might have secretly been rooting for something terrible to happen, like some of you viewers probably were, because that would in turn make for a more interesting video, but I just, I can't be sure. So let me know if you think that Scott was rooting for the good video over the good project. I obviously wanted to recess these C channels on the underside of the table, so I'd marked them while the table was in its exact finished position marked them with pencil, made this quick and easy template, and it's a little bit oversized. It's about a quarter inch larger than the mounting plate itself, and this is gonna make the mounting a little bit easier, and it's also gonna allow for some seasonal wood movement. So that kind of loose fit is by design. I mentioned earlier that there've been some technological advancements in wood finishing since I last made that how-to video, and this is a major one. I've been experimenting with different nano finishes the last couple of years, and I felt like I was just waiting for one that got everything right, because some were pretty good, but none were great until now. This is the new Blacktail Studio N3 Nano, and it is that much better than every single other product available. I would have never gone down the path of putting my name on a product if it wasn't gonna be significantly better than everything else available. It bumps up the contrast, it bumps up the sheen, but most importantly, it bumps up the protection to a point where you can use this in the real world. If you have kids, if you have spills, or if you're just really lazy, you can use this product and your tables will still look brand new. I have never been more excited about a product. I think this is gonna change the way we look at wood finishing going forward. I just launched the new website, n3nano.com, along with international shipping. So if you are someone that takes woodworking seriously, I would be absolutely honored if you tried the N3 Nano on your next project. There'll be links to everything in the video description as well. I finished attaching the top to both the walnut table and the MAPA table, which again, that giveaway is live now. If you want to win that MAPA table, it is free shipping included worldwide. There's a link in the description for that. But here is how this table turned out. And I have never been more proud to say that I was completely wrong. I absolutely freaking love the way that aluminum shelf looks with that Bastone walnut. And the Bastone Walnut, it does all the hard work for me. This wasn't a particularly hard design to make. Again, there's plans available if you wanna make it yourself, but this wood, if you don't buy wood that looks like this, it's not gonna look like this. There is nothing that compares to this. I'm thrilled with how it turned out. I would love to know what you think of this design and this wood. As always, I like to give a little bit of credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So start your question or comment with which table you liked better, Walnut or Mappa, and that way I'll know you made it all the way to the end of the video. As always, thank you so much for watching.